Let's not go to Harvey Norman yet. Let's not even go direct yet. Customers don't even know what this thing is. Let them see the idea in, in a retail store close to them. So when we're introducing this radical new laser pointer uh, that no one's ever seen before, uh, we'll have limited distribution and we'll rely on that university store, uh, university campus electronics store to tell me about it, to show it. Have you thought about this, Simon? Look at what it can do. Let's demonstrate it in action. All right, so they bear a lot of the cost of buyer creation, which is me. Now, once other people see me use it um, in, in various presentations around Australia or the world, um, it starts to build demand. So we can go to slightly higher volume channels. This is where we will um, begin to, to distribute through Harvey Norman and JB Hi-Fi, good guys and so on. Um, we may even here start to introduce a direct channel. We'll go for an, an online channel to get these laser pointers into the hands of presenters. <clears throat> now, we're into a mature market now. We're starting to see even students use these things. We've got the price down because it's a much more efficient uh, in terms of our production um, capacity. Also, it's very competitive. Price points are lower. All of a sudden, students are buying them. Um, to do their own presentations uh, at university. So now we can start to sell these things probably at lower service outlets. You don't really need to know about it anymore. You get it. It's a button that goes forward and back with a, with a little red dot, a chicken laser, you can point at things. Um, so we don't need the service component of it. So we might even start to sell these things places like Officeworks, Kmart, Target. Again, uh, lower priced outlets uh, that are patronised by, you know, more price-sensitive consumers. And all of a sudden, laser pointers no longer are needed because I can control this with my mind. I don't... I have to go and do some surgery and have a, a chip in my head, but nonetheless, I can control the presentation with my mind. I don't need them anymore. Well, we've got excess stock. There's still some inventory to get rid of. Or maybe where that surgery of implanting a chip in my head... Um, is expensive. So in emerging markets, laser pointers will still have a market. But we can get them out anywhere and any time to anyone. So maybe lower priced outlets. Look, this is just an example of how channel structure might change as a product grows, uh, matures and declines. <clears throat> now, in terms of intermediary characteristics, what... Uh, how might they influence the channel? Well, what I would do is I'd go back to the eight functions of channel members from last lecture and say, can this firm, can this retailer do all those or some of these things? If they can't do any of them, if they're weak at handling any of these tasks, then the implication for us is to go direct or go around them or find a different intermediary. Uh, so, you know, maybe that's the case with the Apple stores, is they said, look, we can go to authorised resellers, but one thing resellers cannot do, well, two things, they can't carry the same inventory that we can carry in an Apple store. Secondly, they probably can't support the product like we can with our, what I call geeks, in, uh, geniuses in an Apple store. So, you know, they can't do that as well as us. So we need to go around them or sit next to them and do that through our Apple Store com, um, uh, uh, route to market. You know, and, and the longer the channel, the harder it becomes to monitor what they uh, are doing. Now, monitoring um, a few dozen or hundred Ford distributors around the country is probably relatively easy. Monitoring tens of thousands of corner stores, if you're Colgate, for how they display your toothpaste is impossible. So <clears throat> issues, as, as monitoring becomes more important, more relevant, again, we might build more direct channels. Competitors, there's often a tension between whether we distribute near our competitors or whether we avoid competition altogether. 
I have uh, Amway, for example, um, are a company that said, I don't want to compete in the same channel as my competitors for or whatever Amway produce, um, cleaning products, cosmetics, um, a bit of everything. <clears throat> so Amway go direct to market. These are the Amway knock on your door kind of sales. Anyone work for Amway? Or any direct Tupperware? No? Anyone been to a Tupperware? Anyone had an Amway person knock on their door? Yeah? What did he or she say? Pills. They wanted to sell you pills. Uh, and you were still asleep because it was before 11 o'clock. So you said, what? Come back another time? Or did you buy some pills? Didn't buy pills. Uh, probably good that you didn't. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, this is how they avoid competition. They, they distribute direct to their consumers and in doing so, avoid any head-on competition. They're not just another stand or stall next to L'Oreal, next to Unilever, whatever, in a retail space. Having said that, there are companies like Pizza Hut, well, companies like McDonald's, for one, spend uh, millions and millions of dollars a year assessing the, the, the appropriateness of, an, of a new site. They do traffic flow studies, they do um, surveys of consumers, they do um, a whole lot of demographic analyses, socioeconomic studies, and they say, here is an optimum space for McDonald's. Pizza Hut have one or two people in a real estate division who buy the block next to where McDonald's, you know, bought. The, the logic being, well, hey, they're going to get it right. Um, if we compete next to McDonald's, we'll see a, this area become known for perhaps fast food or a place that acts as a gravitational pull to people because there's now choice. So if you've ever wondered why is it when you go to Sunshine and on the, one of those strips of the high street, you've got 300 retailers of computers and electronic goods and you say, well, why wouldn't you move down the street, you idiot? And why are you competing right next to this guy? Well, oftentimes, the very fact that we know to go to Sunshine for good value electronics products means that it acts in itself as a gravitational pull. So yes, you're competing aggressively in that high street in Sunshine, but, but the upside is that you've got people who are willing to drive to Sunshine to buy the next laptop. So it's a tension. Do we want to compete head on or do we want to avoid competition? I don't have any answers for you as to what works best. That would be a great research product, a uh, research project, but it is something that we need to think about. Of course, what can we do? Yes, I'm talking about Apple's stores as being particularly important or valuable in their strategy, but look, opening up a store on the corner of, of Fifth and whatever in New York is really, really expensive. So do we have the size or the resources to do that ourselves? I'm sorry about these silly flipping around things. It's more annoying than entertaining. I um, don't know why that's happened. So we can, we can dedicate, if we have the resources to dedicate, yes, we can do that sort of thing. If not, we, we may rely on, on agents, on retailers. Um, the bigger we are, the more resources we are, the more responsibility we can, we can take in performing those eight channel functions that we talked about last week or two weeks ago. <coughs> Finally, product mix. Um, what if our product is... Is, is very varied. If you're Unilever with thousands of stock keeping units, products, you, you, you just can't have a Unilever store. That would be silly. So you won't ever see that. You need to rely on intermediaries to break up that, that uh, product mix into um, retail um, offerings that make sense. Um, and of course, if we're all about efficiency effectiveness in service and so on, we need to bring the customer closer to us. Again, more direct channels will be uh, more effective. So the two things we've talked about, one is very clear cut. When we have agency arrangement channels, we, we have to admit the potential for conflict. Conflict will emerge when we are reliant on another business to perform activities on our behalf. The, who are not part of our own corporate structure. So it's inevitable um, 
But we have tools that we can use to fix that or address that. And the second thing is more, well, hey, what should our channel structure look like? Well, look, it really, really depends. It depends on the nature of the product. It depends on what intermediaries are able to do. It depends on the, the corporate, our, our own um, capabilities as a corporation. So there's a lot of things we need to take into consideration before we say, here is the route to market that we will take. Okay, let's, uh, let's leave it at that, and I'll give you a couple of minutes. Have a chat amongst yourselves, and we'll move on. conflict between members of the same level. A retailer conflicting with another retailer. For example, your franchise on Burke Street and then one opens up around the corner and starts taking your customers. Be in conflict with that other retailer. So it's like the vertical conflict means like the conflict between the wholesaler and the... That's right, and this is lateral. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what this, this slide means. Like, so, I, I didn't understand this. Okay, so the, really you've got a manufacturer, you've got a wholesaler, you've got a retailer, and so on. Yeah. If you're a manufacturer saying, I want to get my product to market, yeah. and I need the support in terms of providing information and service from retailers, yeah, yeah. and the only retailers available don't have any service component to them, then you have to do that yourself. So what does he, so you will go direct to market. So let's say you're selling these roasters in Germany and there's no one in Australia who can service a roaster, who can fix a roaster, then you have to do it directly. So you would like to use an intermediary, but you can't because the strengths and weaknesses of the intermediary, only the weaknesses, mean that you can't use them. So you go direct. Like who goes, uh, like we, customer so, does? No, we, we as a manufacturer will go straight to the customer. We can't use an intermediary. Like, right. like a delay. So, like a delay. Like. Well, I mean, if someone can't fix a roaster or install it, they can't be an intermediary. You can't use them as a retailer or an agent because they're just unable to do that. So you've got to look at what intermediaries can or can't do. Okay, before we say let's use them. No, no. All right, welcome back, everyone. So, in a sense, what we've just done is we've, ch we've, we've ticked off the fourth of our four Ps, 
We've been very fair and we've given two lectures. No, we haven't been. That's not true. We had three lectures on promotion, but for pricing, product development and place, we gave two lectures each. So we've been relatively fair um, in giving each a little bit of a, a sample uh, session. You know, as, as you know in this course, you know, your first years, it's your first exposure to marketing. We've got to try to cover as much turf in this subject while making sure that it's coherent and brings uh, a, a, the bigger picture to you as a coherent whole. So we hope, or I hope we've done that in the last, um, well, I suppose, gosh, uh, 10 weeks or nine weeks. Um, what I want to do now is change pace a little bit to look at a, a special area within uh, marketing that I think deserves individual attention. This is uh, for a couple of reasons. One, and this will become apparent as you continue your studies in marketing throughout your degree, we're now starting to think about almost everything we do in terms of service. Now, I don't want to confuse you now, but this computer is a service. Sorry for that demonstration. It's, I like Sony. I, I miss my Sony. This is a service. What service does this provide? Tell me. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Ease of processing ideas, of documents. What else? Speed. Yes? Communication. It facilitates communication. What else does this physic... Don't worry, I won't break it. What? It's already broken. Great. What else does this physical thing do? Store. Yeah, it stores things for you. It stores ideas, it stores messages, and so on. It isn't what we're buying. Remember the old quote that, that the customer doesn't buy the quarter-inch drill bit. He or she buys the ability to make a quarter-inch hole. We've known that for a long time. Now we're starting to embrace it. And we're starting to think about these physical things that we've produced in terms of services. To give you an example, Boeing buy from Rolls-Royce, or an airline for that matter, buy from Rolls-Royce, not an engine, they buy time in the air. They contract with Rolls-Royce, who make engines for planes, to guarantee or to provide time within the air. Because what does Boeing care about? What does United Airlines care about? What does Qantas care about? They don't care about the engine. They just want their planes to hang in the air for a long, long time. However that happens, they don't care. And so they say to uh, Rolls-Royce, you do that for us. There's a company in, in France, a boilermaker company in France, uh, Chauffagiste, that sells ambient temperature. They don't sell boilers that sit in the bottom or basement of a, of a, of a, of a, of a building to a, to a building owner to be run by a janitor. They say, we will guarantee you ambient temperature between 19 and 22 degrees, 365 days a year. However that happens, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We'll do it. We'll make it happen for you. We're buying the service of ambient temperature. IBM, they know that their, their customers don't give a shit, excuse my language, about blade servers or boxes and, 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 and shelves of flicking lights. Do you care about that if you're a customer? No, you just want to get on with business. You want storage processing power, speed of an, an uptime or whatever. So IBM say, we will guarantee you 99.9% uptime of servers. It's not even a server in your house, in your office. There'll be our servers elsewhere. Um, we'll handle that for you. Customers love that. It's the service I'm buying, not the box. Well, you're all using it with Dropbox. I feel sorry for Western Digital who've gone around trying to sell those plug-in buddy backup systems because we're now, we don't care about the, the terabyte box on our desk. That was never what we bought. 
We wanted security and safety of our data. And Dropbox can provide that. Or Mosey.com or whatever these services are. So these are companies that are fundamentally rethinking the physical and, and, and packaging them up again as a service. That's one reason why we're talking about services. The second reason is because 80% of you will work in services. Why do I know that? Well, it's 80% of most developed economies. The service sector represents about 80% of most developed economies. We're a little bit skewed because we dig a lot of rubbish out of the ground. Well, not rubbish, we dig a lot of rocks out of the ground and sell them elsewhere. So we have an economy that's, that, that's a bit skewed away from services, but most developed economies, 80% of their economy runs on services. It's important to understand services. So let's spend a bit of time on them. Okay. I want to talk a bit about what a service is. I want to underscore why it's important. I think I've started to do that already, but I'll talk about some other things. We'll identify some interesting challenges that services marketers face, um, and then what are the solutions to those, namely these additional elements or P's that we have in our toolkit. So that's the three objectives I want to follow up for this last uh, half of the session. All right, so <clears throat> why are we interested in services? Well, number one, I think, is that we are now fundamentally recasting the way we think about physical goods as services. All of a sudden, this is the mindset we're bringing to any business. We should. We should do that. In any business you're in, think about the service that you're providing to customers. Any business. But we know especially that the economy as, or the service aspect of any economy is growing in importance. Um, when you have just a simple pressure like double income families, all of a sudden you give rise to millions of opportunities for services. Whether it's childcare, whether it's garden maintenance, whether it's you know, home maintenance or repair, whatever, all of a sudden the things we might have done ourselves, we now outsource to others. And when you think about Jim's mowing, this is a business, or Jim's anything really, a business that started from a dude with a sun hat and a mower who was selling his services for 10 bucks an hour, I'll mow your lawn, who then found out that mowing your lawns was quite an attractive business because of this change in society that nurtures or supports service providers. And now Jim's is a multimillionaire as a result of that. We are seeing service industries become deregulated. That increases the importance of us as marketers or business people more generally in their, these particular industries. So. In, in the old days, banking was very much regulated. It still is, to some great extent. In fact, to the point where the Commonwealth Bank of Australia was a government-owned bank. The government owned the Commonwealth Bank. It was in the banking industry. Super regulated, super um, controlled. Marketing issues weren't as big. Uh, Co Commonwealth Bank made money every year, irrespective of whether they had any customers. People made a wage, people could turn up to work and had job security, even if the bank made a loss. So, you know, deregulating, well, and we also, of course, owned the government-owned Qantas. I mean, what a government has to do in owning a, an airline, I, I'll never know, but we did. Government-owned Qantas. It still owns a third of Telstra. It still owns a fair percentage of a telco company. Now, there's some good reasons why governments owns, own some of these industries. Airlines, I can't really come up with a good reason, maybe one or two, but there are good reasons why they get involved in banking or telcos. But by and large, um, they, they shouldn't be too heavily involved. And as a result, these firms like Telstra, like CBA, Commonwealth Bank, like Qantas, have had to start to think more commercially about how they operate. These are service firms having to think more like a, a proper for-profit business. 
So that's why we're interested in uh, services marketing increasingly. And that's only happening more and more. The Telstra will have inevitably, I'm sure, be sold completely. Professional services, these guys never cared about marketing. Um, they, they almost didn't have to. You know, they had a monopoly control or over the supply of lawyers. You know, there were only a couple of degrees, Melbourne and Monash, where you could get a law degree, for example. Same with medicine. Um, so we had a limited supply of lawyers, quite a bit of demand. You know, these guys could charge whatever they wanted. Um, the industry itself forbade any lawyer from advertising. So you couldn't reach out to a customer through communications. I mean, you used to price in a way that had no re resemblance to customer value. Does anyone have a lawyer as a parent? No? And even if you did, you're all young, so you, even your parents may not even have, have been involved with this pricing structure. But if you were a lawyer, you charged by the word. If you wrote a thousand words, you multiplied it by 50 cents per word, and that's whatever, and that's what you charge your client. Is that customer focused? What does that incentivize? More words. Are more words better? Not necessarily. The right words matter, not more words. Is that a market-oriented business model? Crikey, no. It's not even close. <clears throat> so professional services now are uh, those regulations and controls over supply, over advertising are gone, and you can now medicos and, and doctors can uh, and uh, lawyers rather can now uh, or now must operate more commercially. So that's why we're more interested in services. There's intense competition. As I say, now you can get a law degree from, from a trove, from RMIT, and so on. <clears throat> you know, there are more lawyers on the market, more doctors on the market. There's much more competition. Private providers of healthcare. You know, we're an ageing population. Um, so again, this gives up, provides opportunities for um, services, whether it's aged care, um, healthcare uh, add-ons, um, you know, uh, respite care, or whatever that's associated with, with, with the ageing population, these elements of the economy will only become more important. And as, I, as I, we know from uh, the uh, session on product development and co-creation in particular, as we embrace co-creation, what we're basically saying is that we're moving more into the provision of a service around our physical goods, and not the physical good itself. So how can we help you to build or construct your own bundle of value? So we're more about helping customers construct their own bundle of value than we are about making something, throwing it into the market, landing on the lap of the consumer and saying, cop it, take it or leave it. So co-creation as a business model is, is moving the way we think about services uh, into the mainstream. But services marketers face problems. As soon as we talk about a service, we're adding these four key problems. Now, if I was just selling, building a computer and throwing it over the wall into the market and selling it, then I don't face these problems. But so, as soon as I say, come into our house, come into my factory, let's sit next to each other, and let's build a computer together, then we are talking about a service. I'm providing Tim, Stuart, Gavin, Leo. I'm providing Leo with the service of co-creating a computer. Leo and I are engaged in a service. And then these four factors emerge. Intangibility, inseparability, variability, perishability. Let's have a look at them. OK. <clears throat> well, with intangibility, it is just what it says. A service cannot be picked up, touched, felt, weighed. I picked Leo's computer up before and I held it aloft. I can do that with a physical good, but the co-creation service, I can't. 
I can't show you what it was because it disappeared as it was being created. Even Leo couldn't tell you about it. He could describe the sort of a process, but by and large, it was intangible. So while there may be tangible outputs, namely the computer associated with any service, by and large, the performance is of providing the co-creation experience is intangible. That performance, which is no less valuable to Leo, is intangible. The computer, yeah, fine. That, he's happy with that too. But he was really happy with the co-creation experience and that was intangible. So we can't feel, see, touch, taste or whatever with services. The computer or its component parts can be evaluated prior to purchase, whereas a service can only be evaluated subjectively prior to purchase. <clears throat> you know, I've got to make judgments. I've got to say, yeah, I like Leo. Like